What's up, Kevin? How you doing, man? Dude, I'm I'm good. I'm I'm glad to be here. Is this is this round two with you on your podcast? It's round two, man. I think you were the first, second, or third or so to actually start off with me as a guest, like about a year and a half ago. So, um, yeah, you're the second time around, man. I love it. Uh, cool. do, do you post video of this or, you, or is it straight audio? I forget. No, I do. I, I put it on YouTube, I think. Um, I actually have to say, I don't know much about this podcast outside of I get on and talk to cool people. I mentally, you record it. I mentally take on the information and I learn and then I pass it off to Kylie and she does what she does. So I know it goes somewhere that I listen to it every once in a while. Do, hey, have you ever like when did you stop listening to your show or did you ever? No, I listen. I still listen when I need to go back and listen. So what will happen is like, I really do my best to just be in the moment with the guests. So that way I can be, I'm trying to be a good host. Right. And okay. so uh, to me, that's important. And so I do that. And then, uh, so I'll give you a great example. It does, if Dustin Runyon comes on my podcast, he's going to say something that I have to listen to two or three times mm -hmm. to even start to absorb. So anytime it's a guest where I'm like, if I find myself taking notes or writing something down, like guaranteed, I'm going to go back and listen to the audio of that at least once. Cause I'm now going to go listen to it as a listener. Whereas before I'm listening as the guy, just trying to pull the questions and stories out of the person. Okay. No, totally makes sense. Yeah. So uh, yeah, Dustin Runyon would be one that you'd go back and listen to. He was, on a, to. he was on a zoom that you put on like a few days ago and he had 30 minutes on his spot. And man, that guy, I just love give... the, I just love the fact that he won't allow a market conversation or excuses into the equation. It's, le it's legitimately all you like, and there's nothing more satisfying to me than the problem being all me, because that seems solvable and the market and everything else seems so unsolvable. So like, yeah. I'm actually so intrigued by it. He's like, there's no business issues. There's personal issues that lead into your business. <laughs> and I was like, game on. So, so no, I, I know what you mean when you say like, you got to listen back. So no, I, uh, I listened to like the first few shows that I did. And then now I just, every once in a while, will listen for a sec just to like, make sure my quality of audio is good or whatever. But, um, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, I, uh, I trust Sarah to spot check the, the audio. And then I, like I said, I go, I go back and listen as a listener. Um, maybe, 25% of the time, I would say I go back and re-listen as a listener because okay. there was something I just couldn't absorb while I was in the moment. And you've been doing that podcast for what, four or five years or? Yeah, dude. Uh, November will be five years. That's next, next level. That's what the That's podcast is next called. Level. Yeah. The next, next level agents podcast. Okay. Do you actually, do you get people that like reach out to you and tell you that like certain episodes have did something to them uh -huh. as far as like impactful? Constantly, uh, okay. which is one of my favorite parts. In fact, one of my one of my good friends in the industry, you, you might have met her or at least know her. Her name is Via Williams. Yeah, um, I know. She her. was at the she was at our mastermind last week. Um, Via just posted, I think it was yesterday, that I recorded a podcast in two thousand in twenty twenty one with Katie Klesitz, Frank's wife, mm -hmm. um, about investing and how she how she bought fifty homes in a year, and Via so Via has told me this personally. Mm, I bet you five times since this episode came out, but then she posted about it yesterday or uh, it was either yesterday or the day before on every social platform, um, just telling her story, but she just tagged me and Fred in it going, I heard Katie on Kevin and Fred's podcast and it totally changed. Cause like she went from like owning one home to owning 11 in that time frame, Like she went ham just like you, bro. Yeah. So, it's, it, it's cool to see, man. Like it's, it's like, you know, you know, Obviously, we know each other well, and just like Dave, Dave Zizinski being on your podcast yeah. and like legitimately changing the rest of probably my business life, you know, it's super impactful. You don't, you know, you, you, I don't know, I kind of didn't think that would happen with my podcast, but I've had people reach out and they're just like, hey, dude, like you totally changed my mindset or this show was the one that pivoted this in my business. And it feels really cool. And you would think, why not? You know, we've, you and I have listened to many podcasts where somebody's opened our minds and we think, oh, okay, maybe we're listening to you know, Rogan or, or someone big that has like the biggest audience ever and that they would have that impact. But you realize it's not the, it's not always the audience size. It's actually who's the guest on the show and are they relatable to that person? Um, and some of the best shows you have, someone thinks it's the worst show. So I just kind of keep that in perspective of you're just doing an interview and you're trying to find somebody to listen 
and relate uh, because not everyone's relatable to everyone. Yeah, well, that's that's a fact. I'll tell you, I so the way I keep myself interested is I do it selfishly. I do the interviews because I want to do the interviews. I don't yeah. interview people I don't like, people I don't want to interview. I just don't do it. Um, and, and so then I think that there that keeps like kind of a for for to 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 use the overused word authenticity about it. But the reality is like I, I know for me, when I listen to podcasts, I'm doing it for one of two reasons. I'm trying to pick up on something or I'm trying to entertain myself. And I can listen to the same show, if you will, not like the same topic, but like, say like the Joe Rogan show or the Tim Ferriss show or Brene Brown. I, and I could, one episode, I could go, I'm only listening to this for, because I want to entertain myself because I, I just want to be distracted for a little bit, or I'm only listening to this because I'm trying to pick up some ideas or learn something uh, or learn about the subject. And I think people, I think most people or a lot of people do that as well. So if you listen to a podcast with somebody like, you know, you gave the example of you and Dave Z where you like, dude, you're always trying to learn. You're constantly trying to learn and pick something up. And so of course you're going to, if you're actually open-minded and trying to learn something, dude, there's, there's people that can teach you something everywhere. Yeah. I think that's probably the coolest thing about our friendship, man, is over the last two years of me knowing you well, I, what I, what I love about our friendship is I don't think we've talked about really production or selling homes really ever. And I think that's probably the coolest thing about our friendship. Not saying that I don't appreciate the ones that I have that I do. It's just, everyone's got this place in your life on why like they're your homie. And for me, like you and I, I always love that we you know, we connect more like I feel like we connect more over personal stuff, like growth, thinking how we think what we're trying to do to improve um, leverage. We're talking about things that maybe our real estate production has afforded us to do now, uh, yeah. you know, now being in like a, a different opportunity or a different season in life. So I think like you and I merged around like season 16, 17 yes. of our careers. And yep. so we were kind of done with that conversation, even though we have to have it often. And I still have to have that conversation to help, you know, I need help all the time still in my production business, but like you and I, like, I feel like if I had called you and said, Hey dude, can you help me with like this repair list or like, what's up with this appraisal? You'd be like, is this like this, like, are you hot, like hostage right now? Like how did this call happen? So that's what I that's love how about I know. our friendship. I'd be, like, I'd be like, blink twice if they're holding a gun <laughs> to your head. Um, that's so funny. Um, you know, it's my wife actually made this observation. We were taught, it was me and my wife and a friend, a non-industry friend. I forget who it was, but it wasn't that long ago. Uh, and the subject of like events came up or something. And this person asked a question and my wife was like the first to point out, she's like, well, this is me paraphrasing. She basically said, no, Kevin doesn't really he's never really talking about real estate with his real estate friends. And I was like, yeah, I was like, I was like, that's right. I was like, anybody who like really needs to talk about stuff like that, like we're probably not hanging out that much. Like I'm not like, there's a time and place for that, but like, those aren't, those people aren't going to the same event that I'm going to usually sometimes they are, but they're usually not. And so, yeah, we get together and it's a quote unquote real estate event where we, talk about pretty much everything else. Cause I don't want to say, cause like you've either, I hate to use the word figured it out, but you've either figured this out or you haven't. And if you figured it out, you realize there's some, yes, there's a time and place to share some best practices, but there's so many other more important things to talk about. Yeah. Yeah. Cool, man. So let's the, probably the only time you and I have ever talked production is when I usually start off the show like this, because the real estate space, what's cool about it is I think that's where a lot of friendships start. Like you and I, obviously, like we know each other because we both have real estate teams. We're actually still trying to have our real estate teams produce. So just so the listeners know, you can do it in 20 seconds, but what what do you got going on for real estate? I mean, I just want them to know that you do sell quite a bit uh, of why we might, and, and we still might not talk about that today. <laughs> uh, so, I, so I run a, so I've got a business partner, Fred. Uh, we have a team. We're based in Tempe, Arizona. We still have a few agents outside of the state of Arizona that we've run an expansion business now since like 2014 uh, in Denver, uh, but yeah, as well as San Luis Obispo, California, and a little bit in Nashville, Tennessee. Nonetheless, the majority of our sales business is focused in in the Phoenix area. Um, sell a couple hundred homes a year, nothing special. I, do, I don't... Um, 
you know, I don't personally spend a lot of time on that. Uh, in fact, I, I spend about an hour a week or so. Fred's probably at this point now down to an hour or two a week as well in that business. So it's a, to use the, the MREA language, if you will, it's almost a seventh level. I call it like a six and a half level business yeah. uh, because I don't actually think there's really much, much of a seventh level business. I mean, there, there could be, could, we could walk away from it totally. Um, that said, uh, you know, we've got great people in place who are running it, selling a few hundred homes a year and, um, we're focused elsewhere on it, but yes, we do. We've done that and I'll show my age, uh, and I'll say, you know, we've sold like something like 3,500 homes since Fred and I started working together in 08. Yeah, that's awesome, man. Yeah, you do. It's cool to see, like you, you, you sell a lot of units. You actually say it so casually. And I know there's a lot of hard work that got you there, but I love the whole process where I can just tell by all the conversations we've had over two years that you've always been into more of the buy back your time philosophy. You know, like you could have made like a ton, probably more money if you had been sitting at kitchen tables and showing buyers homes. But the quality of life that I've seen you actually be able to live is just, I mean, it's super cool to see. I mean, there's yeah. some out there that watch it and they're inspired by it. I'm one of them. So it's just, there's people who are following the producers that are actively doing the work every day. And then there's people following the people who are figuring out like, what are the you know new seasons of their career or what could they just compound on like this opportunity got them to here and now they can go to the next one. And I've seen you do that quite well. I, uh, dude, I, it, a rude awakening yesterday. I, I sat in a, in a mastermind, like lunch with a, like a special guest. And I just, I mean, I kind of just did it cause I wanted to be in the room and see who was in the room and talk. And there's a lot of like, if I, you, you would probably know everyone, every person's name, if I said their name to you. And the kind of the host or the special guest, if you will, she read out everyone's question that had submitted a question ahead of time. And these are all people that sell a lot of real estate and make a lot of money. And without exception, they've all, they all sell real estate and don't own a business. And like, they're all they're all of them had questions about leverage and time and their focus and hiring and all this stuff. And I'm like, even the most quote unquote successful of us, like just nobody treats this business like a business. And I think it's important to go to know like, Hey, if you, if you hear me say, talk about my business versus somebody else talk about their business, you got to know that we're literally playing different games. Not that one is better than the other. They're just different, but they're different. I think this is where I will give myself credit is Fred and I committed to this a, more than a decade ago. We're like, no, that's the path we're going. I'm literally not going to let my income depend upon me sitting in someone's living room. Like we've had that actual conversation. Was there ever a time when you made that decision that there was any like doubt? Did you have any conversations with your wife or your family? Or I mean, even with Fred, where did you guys have anything where you're like, hey, like we actually want to make more money? I mean, how, how did that come? Because you're, you, you do trade some money usually in those eras. I mean, dollar per hour, you were probably making more, but that's still a hard move to pull off for a lot of people. I got tired of, um, I got tired of dealing. I just didn't want to, I literally just didn't want to work with buyers or sellers. I uh, like literally just didn't want to do it. I think maybe, um, I was lucky in the sense that we had just had our first baby. So that would have been, um, well, 11 years ago here pretty soon. And by the time we'd really made this decision. And so my, I, I, I say lucky, meaning like my wife was like, she was focused elsewhere. And the truth is like, it's not like we were going to be on food stamps. Like did I, I, Fred and I had an actual conversation where like, are you willing to like make less money? Like, what if we went back to like 150 a year each? And that's all we made for a couple of years in order to build a machine to get out of it. Um, and knowing this might actually take two or three years, you, you know, and, uh, we both agreed that it, that it was worth it. And so we went, okay, cool. We'll make that much money. Like we probably won't take anything over that. The rest can go back into hiring people and building stuff out. And, uh, we're not working weekends ever again. So did you feel making that decision that you weren't going to go actively do that type of stuff with clients? Do you feel like that's what afforded you some of the opportunities that you have now in your life where you could just think outside of 
I got to work eight, nine hours a day. Like you, were you, is that, is that what got you into like joining EXP and seeing that type of opportunity? Yeah. Because in a way it forced me, cause it forced me to not, I'm going to say cheat by just taking more listings. Cause I could have just said, I'll take more clients and then bring home more personal income. Right. Instead of growing the business. So it forced me number one, to work on the business. And then number two, as the business actually started to mature and like become something it's afforded us an enormous amount of free time, an enormous amount of free time. And then we've been able to parlay that free time. And so that, that free time turned into at one point, dude, right before we, I don't know if, if I've even told you this, but right before we joined EXP, like maybe six months before, five months before Fred and I decided we we're just to play this trick where Tuesdays and Thursdays were not allowed to be work days or they were not allowed to be group 46, 10 days. We had to, we could work those days, but they had to be focused on making money outside of selling real estate. Wow. And so we started thinking that we started taking two days a week to like, what other business could we do? What thing could we add, but not no group 46, 10 time at all. And then like a couple months in is when we found EXP and it was like, you know, then we leaned in, leaned into that. What was, what, what, were there any, were a few options on the table that you guys thought about that you'd, you'd mind sharing or, or no, yeah, or no, we went down. I mean, we really actually had the, like, um, the outline built for like, we were going to do like a kind of like a coaching training platform. Okay. Not like, not like one-to-one coaching. We'd both done that. Uh, and, and, and didn't necessarily love it. Uh, cause it felt like too much of a job, but we, so we were like, we can create content. We've always created content. So we started working on like products to sell. Um, we also were busy talking to other um, business owners in other industries about like what they invest in and what their businesses are. And we were actively pursuing um, other businesses like, hey, is there something we could start on the side or is there something we could learn about uh, to to make money? So we, the only thing we really leaned into was the product everything else was way more exploratory than anything else. But so, so during that time, that's when EXP got, that's when it got presented to you. Yeah. I, it, it's not even that it got presented to us. That's when we decided we were going to be open okay. minded enough to listen because we, okay. we were actively avoiding EXP. Like, let me be really clear about that. I was actively trying to leave KW for a year and we were actively avoiding learning about EXP because we thought we knew what it was. Why do you, why do you think people have, I'm, I'm sure you were getting hit up by a lot of people. I mean, you're a huge player in the industry with actually with a lot of influence. And why do you think people do that? Is it just like something they think of? Is it somebody that had like left a bad taste in their mouth? Because I actually, there was a, a good, not a good friend of mine, but a friend of mine the other day posted in a group on Facebook, Hey, leaving this certain company, um, open to my options, no EXP. And first I was thinking, Wow, it sounds like the same person that says I'm leaving Facebook. You know, like yeah, just, totally. Just leave. <laughs> pay, pay attention to me on this platform. Yes, I say it, I don't want to be on. Yeah. So this person said that specifically, like, hey, I'm I'm, I'm leaving my broker. She's a pretty good producer in another state. No exp. Where do you think people come up with that type of stuff? Because when I was introduced to it, I had never known really what it was. So I'm, I'm guessing you did if you had that feeling. So two things for us, and I, and I can't speak for everyone else, but I think this is probably true for a lot of people. Number one, yes, I'd had some interactions with people that I would consider unsavory. Um, like I didn't like them, I didn't, or I didn't like their approach. And so it gave me a certain uh, sense or taste in my mouth of what EXP was, whether that was right or wrong didn't matter. And then the other thing is I kind of had been, I mean, the, the group that I ran in, the circle that I ran in was very anti-EXP. And the reason why is because it was kind of a, and, you know, looking back, it's like, no, duh. Like it was coming. So I was at KW, I was in Gary Keller's top top 100 mastermind. I was in his pirate mastermind, which is like, there was like 20 of us um, that were, you know, that were pushing hardcore and expansion. And the reality was, was like, Gary was shitting on it every day. And so we all took Gary's word as the gospel for everything. And so it, between that and like my friends not liking it and then having a couple unsavory interactions, we just, you know, I just had this thing in my mind of what it was. And I couldn't, the funny thing is I couldn't have been more wrong. <laughs> I just had to finally like 
go, uh, okay, I'm either open-minded or I'm not. What, what, what made you open-minded and what did you love about the company initially? I think the two things that made me open-minded were there's two very specific moments and they literally happened within like a day of each other. Number one was I have a friend, a good friend of mine who um, is also friends with Glenn Sanford. And he said to me, he, and this person was sort of counseling me through my exploring, leaving KW phase um, and giving me some advice. And he's like, you know, I think you should probably talk to Glenn. Like I'm going to, he's like, I'm going to call him and I'm going to tell him that you're going to call him and he, that, you know, ask him to take your call. And you should just say to him the things that you said to me that you're concerned about. And so that happened. And by the way, I talked to Glenn and I thought Glenn was awesome. He's, he's kind of weird at first. Cause he's just his mind, the way he works. Like yeah. he's not your average entrepreneur in my opinion, but I was like, man, I got off the phone with him like 20 minutes later. And I was like, this dude is either trying to solve or already solved every problem that I think I need to solve in my business. I like this. So I have that. And then simultaneously, Curtis Johnson, who I've been friends with since almost since I got in the business, he had moved to EXP um, five, six months prior. And uh, we, he, he did the worst pitch of all time. Never really tried to recruit us, but he says he did. <laughs> and, and, uh, we went to lunch. We agreed. We're like, yeah, dude, you know, at the time we were going to start an independent brokerage and he was going to go to EXP and we're like, yeah, let's just, you know, touch base in a few months. You tell us maybe it'll be awesome the way you think it is. And I'm not kidding you, Chris, this is what stood out to me the most. We go to lunch. It's, it's May 2nd, 2018. We go to lunch, um, at four peaks in Tempe, Arizona. Like I remember every, I know I could point the table out to you. Curtis looked like he had reverse age 15 years and I'm not exaggerating. He <laughs> looked 15 years younger. And that was the thing that stuck out to me the most. And then he started to tell us about the company. I think I was actually in that day. Fred needed one more meeting. I was in that day. Really? Yep. Okay. What, what, what was it? Like what, what was the problem that they were solving for you? It solves a different problem. I think for everybody, what, what was it for you? Was it the expansion uh, and things like that? For me at the time, it was the expansion and it was actually having something in the future. It was giving me a chance to be entrepreneurial without putting a ton of constraints on me. Yeah. And it was everything from the office space issue to, to the stock. I never, and by the way, the stock has been incredibly amazing for us. I totally discounted it. I was like, yeah, maybe that'll be something. Maybe it won't. Um, but I was like, it's cool though, that it's an option. Cause I don't, I don't have that option anywhere else. And so there was, there was a lot that went into it, but um, those were the big things. So when we went to, uh, we went to park city, probably, I don't know, probably three weeks ago. Now we went to park city. We had a mastermind there and it was specifically a recruiting mastermind. I mean, that's, you know, it's, it's probably the coolest thing now to go to are those types of masterminds because, you know, we're sitting in there and we're trying to figure out like, how do we solve the agents in the, in our community's problems? Right. Like, how do we solve their problems? Like, how, how could they sell more homes? How could they live better lives? How could they actually have this exit strategy that we have the opportunity to have? And that's what I love about those, because people might have this sense of like, oh, he's going to a recruiting mastermind and have this sense of like, but I'm like, no, that's that's the same as all the brokerage owners or team leaders being in a mastermind and talking about the same thing. So that's one I like to start there is. There's nothing wrong with someone being a realtor in production and saying, I want to go sell 60, 70, 80 homes a year. Like that's my mastermind for that. And then I can also sit in this mastermind, just like the owners do of all these brokerages. And I can talk about the same conversations that they're having in that converse. I mean, I remember in that mastermind, you, you will somewhat allow it. Fred will not. Like when someone starts talking about like a home sale, it's no, we're done with that one. Let's move on. It's for another day. Yeah, that's a, that's a different room. That's a this different is, room. This is how can we help other realtors solve their issues that they have. Um, and so it's, it's really cool. Cause I'm like, you can do both those in your life at the same time. I think a lot of agents think like there's, well, if you're selling real estate, you got to go to that mastermind or you got to exit out of that space. No more selling homes. Now you got to go own your own brokerage. You got to go, you got to own Bowers real estate now to now be in that room where you can talk about how I'm going to get agents to join. But 
it's so interesting how like all these agents that are producing, they recruit to their team. Uh, team leaders recruit to their brokerages. Owners recruit to their brokerages. But the second someone's doing both in the day, all of a sudden it can look at a little bit differently. I have no problem with it. It's just a thing that I see that I wish more people could understand that you can still sell real estate and be an owner in your company or still, it would be like saying, Hey Bowers, if you um sell real estate, you, you can't buy real estate. Like, like you either, yeah. like if there's not, like there's no, there's no option to do that. And so that's what I loved about that um, mastermind we went to, but you, you didn't bring it up there, but you brought up like the NCAA athlete. You were the first one that sparked my thought process on that and made me really dig deep into that. So can you explain kind of that scenario for people? Yeah. So it's, it's really prevalent now with the, with the NCAA athlete or, um, uh, you know, one of the other examples I gave was like, and I'm not even a big fan of him, uh, LeBron James with beats by Dre. So there's this point a few years ago where athletes started to realize they like they're actually themselves a brand as well. You've heard the you've heard the 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 sentence, I'm not a businessman, I'm a business, comma, man. Yeah. Right. And realtors are just now starting to realize that too. Um now brokerage owners have known this forever. In fact, when I was at KW, I remember the owner of the first office I joined telling me, like, well, you have to have an icon agent. Uh, you have to have five of them because they'll attract other agents in the city. People will want to be around them. And so like they've known that forever because it's, it's why, you know, let's Chris, if you were an agent right now with your massive production uh, and influence at say a, a, a local Remax or a KW, right? Especially a KW. And you're like, Hey, I'm going to leave and I'm going to go to EXP or I'm going to go to ABC real estate. They would literally let you instead of letting you leave they no would, cap they'd be like stay for free yeah and then if that wasn't enough they'd be like i'll tell you what in fact this is a real example of an agent i know not only were was she offered to stay for free she was offered because she was going to come to exp she beat icon agent easily she, she was also offered sixteen thousand dollars in exp stock a year they're like we'll buy you sixteen thousand dollars worth of exp stock no way it's finally said to her like why do you think that they would do that why do you think that they would be willing to not only not make money on you, but to then have to write a check to you to keep you there? Do you think that just maybe, just maybe you are more valuable to them than your cap? And maybe even your cap plus the money that they offered you? The, the answer is yes, right? Yeah. So all that to say, like, I think you like athletes have, they've all sort of realized, like, I actually have this intrinsic value through my relationships and through my reputation and through my ability to help other people. Like there's a, there's a value on it. And brokerages have known this forever, but it's like agents just learn this. Like they just figured it out. Yeah. And it's like, I mean, in, influence is a currency. I mean, there's yes. nothing wrong. There's nothing wrong with that. As long as I, I feel like as long as you have good intentions, you know, there's, there's leaders with good intentions and there's leaders with bad intentions. And Fact. so like, I, I really feel I'm like, Hey, if you're a leader with influence and you've got good intentions, lean into that, you know, it is a currency. It can be used. It can change a lot of people's lives. And, um, but yeah, man, you, you just, I remember you explaining that NCAA athlete one time to me and it was just that, that really, cause I'm a sport, like everything's a sports analogy. I mean, I don't even watch a lot of sports anymore because I don't have the time, like everything in my office is always a sports analogy. And when you were saying, you know, it's the athlete, finally, it's the college athlete. It was always simple for the colleges to say, Hey, like you're going to make your big bucks when you go pro until some of them realize like, Hey, I'm just going to be the like Heisman trophy quarterback here. And then not like I'm going one season, two seasons, maybe in pro and I'm not going to make it. So like, I want to make my 12 million here. I don't want to make my 2 million here for two years. So it's like, that's so finally they said like, Hey, we want to get paid for our influence. If we're going to, if you're going to sell our jerseys, we want to make some money off this stuff. If you're going to, if you're going to go down this lane, like we want to be a part of it. There's a, you know, there's another great analogy is like, think about like a book publisher or a movie studio. Okay. So like Liam Neeson, he's a, he's a movie star, right? He probably gets paid 20 million. Like they do taken 18. He's going to probably get paid $20 million to, to film that movie. Right. 
Yeah. And that's a dude, that's a good gig. Like that's a lot of that's a high paying money. But do you like, do you think like do you think that if they're willing to pay him $20 million, like the studio might be onto something? Like, hey, if it's worth it to have like yeah, what I'm saying is like there's they're going, hey, we're gonna make you a star. I'll put you on the stage. Let me stroke your ego. Yeah. Because I know that if I do that, if I just house the movie stars or the publishing stars or whatever, then they know that that they're they're really the ones that make the money. And I think too, the other thing is like as an industry, we all kind of like everybody wants to be acknowledged. Don't get me wrong. Um, but we like we let our egos get stroked too much and and quite frankly, like brokerage owners know that and uh, and the leaders in the industry know that. And so they know that if they just lean into that, they can use that for their gain. It looks like they're doing something for us. It's for their gain. And what's cool about that is, I mean, you talking about how you were thinking about going into like the coaching space. And that was actually Brittany and I probably four years ago, we started putting some programs together and it was Agent Excel. Like we had titled it Agent Excel. Interestingly enough, like we ended up at EXP where it had kind of a hook of a name. that It, it looks like we had made that name afterwards. It was just God's plan, right? So we were sitting there for probably a year on some of our spare time building out some like, you know, we had a, a learning platform and we were building like, you know, how to get repeat and referral business, how to do open houses, more of my mindset on how you just got to get things done. And when we, we, we kind of package that up a little bit and then realize like, oh shoot, like this is good content. Like where's the revenue model in this? That's what I was thinking. I was like, where's the revenue model? And then where's the revenue model that if I got to go pitch this to title companies, lenders, or agents that I can be compensated enough because if I'm just doing an active job again, if I've got to go spend four hours to pitch this $499 product, I could have spent four hours and made $26,000. So I got into this bind after I built it. So I had I had good intentions because I'm like, I want to build something for other realtors. More of like, I always said, I didn't even look at it as classes. I said, I want to make a documentary of my 17 years and just figure out how to package this documentary up and sell it. So I'm telling people like, hey, I don't, if you don't like the story, that's totally fine. It's just my story. So if you like see somebody or you resonate with it, then go with it. Like it's somebody who just went from here to here and it worked. Right. And yeah. so we were trying to package that up. No revenue model got to the end. I was like the revenue models that I found seemed like a job that paid me a lot less than selling homes, parked it on the shelf for like a year. And then that's when I was presented with EXP and then realized that my back end revenue model was really like the EXP format or, or how that structure works with the company. So it's just cool because I think there's a lot of people who, you know, share EXP and they have like really, really solid intentions of trying to change people's lives production, like leading with, I want you to sell more homes so that you can get that money so you can buy assets. So you can start living a little bit easier life. Once you start living a little bit easier life, you start having more options to keep going up this ladder. Uh, yeah. But it's, it's interesting that you had that coaching kind of thought. We had that coaching thought. I'm sure a lot of people, you know, that are quote unquote recruiters in EXP have that coaching mentality. Um, Absolutely. I don't think there's anything wrong with it. No, because it's, I think it stems, you know, I think it stems from a desire to actually help other people yeah. to go, cool. Like I look at it as I got so, like I mentioned, I've known Curtis Johnson almost since I got licensed, but I, like, I got so lucky to meet people like him and some others that Russell and Wendy Shaw and so many others that like helped my business right away. Like I was nobody. Um, I didn't, you know, we like, they were just were willing to be open and share things with us. And it, and then that, you know, I, I realized like, that's actually how I really like to learn. And so I'd, I've gotten so much from other realtors that I've always wanted to give more to other realtors. So yeah. It feels good. That, yeah, it does. It feels good. I mean, it's the same. It's the same thing as like why we built built teams. I mean, I had I had a team because I mean, mm -hmm. obviously, I like to make a profit, but it was really fun to, you know, not everyone wants to go have a team. Like I genuinely at the time was enjoying helping the agents, and then I realized I was enjoying helping the agents on my team, but I wasn't really enjoying the 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 profit model of having that team, and yeah. so like I was just like disconnecting from like this is what I like about the team, and this is what I don't. And then it's cool when you find something that can scratch that itch where you're like, hey, these like few things that I loved about the team 
And the few things that I didn't like about the team, I could just partner over here and I can get both those. And man, like it's a sweet spot when you find that, when it's like, Hey, it, it, it helps, it helps the realtor. And then it helps you. And you guys are both on equal playing fields. Like, I think that's when like things start excelling and it starts feeling like flow state as if like, this is how it was meant to be. Like, why did it take this long is what I'm saying now. Yeah, totally. Like how to, so, um, do you mind saying how many people you have like in your EXP organization? Not in mind at all. Uh, 2080 is as of this morning. Really? Yeah. That's cool, man. Yeah. I wish That's it was higher. Cool. I mean, I I got to uh I think uh 67 this morning. Nice. And so that that's super special, you know, because I mean anybody listening to this, you know, I, I, let's just say this now. There's someone in their car right now listening to this that's like, "Whoa, did we just go on an EXP pitch?" And yes. I'm like, "Hey, that's fair. Like we really just did. Like I think you can actually say out loud that I love something and I'm going to support it and I'm going to try to cause awareness and there's going to be someone that doesn't like this conversation and that's cool. And, but there's going to be someone I, I know personally right now that there's going to be people in two and three years that have told me they listened to this and, and their life was changed. And I'm cool I, with that. I, w- I would, I would make that same bet. And you know, here's the deal. The thing you got to realize about this is uh, so one of our executives at the company, Michael Valdez, he worked at Realogy for 17 years and he high, 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 high up as well there, just like he is at EXP. He said something about six or seven months in, to being with the company. He's like, you know, I've been at this company for like six months now, and there literally has not been a day go by that somebody hasn't said to me, this company has changed my life. He's like, I was at Realogy for 17 years and never once did anybody say that to me. And so when people go, man, those EXPers are weird and they're, they're always trying to talk about it. Just take a second to understand because we've seen it and we've experienced it change lives like literally change lives all because glenn had the like the foresight to go what if we made a model that like rewarded the agents and brokers like that's it instead of instead of it just being a few select people who got there first and wrote a check to it to and you know claimed a territory what if it was equal to everybody mm-hmm. and everybody could have the same shot, no matter when they joined the company and we shared half of it. And it's like, boom, now you've got something that can literally impact, you know, thousands of people's lives. Yeah. Yeah. Tens and then of the, thousands. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's also really cool to see like my, my journey and joining XP was, I, I didn't know what it was, Like when, when Dave Jasinski was on your podcast and I was at the gym listening to it, I had n- no idea when I called Dave the next day and said, Hey, can you help me solve this problem? Can you help me? I'm selling a hundred plus homes a year. And I need like what you talked about on that podcast, like that felt good. Can we meet? Well, when we met, when we met at his office, I think it was the next day in Chandler, he had helped me solve my problem there for about an hour and a half. He he'd give me, he he knew my style. Like he doesn't have to get tacked. Like he doesn't have to get in the weeds with me. He just needed to give me a vision Yeah, and knew that I would run with that vision. Like, whoa, I've never even like thought of that. I just knew this 50, 50 model that I'd always learned. I didn't know this like salaried model. Like my brain had never went there. So he didn't have to get lost in the weeds with me. He's like, Hey, this looks like a guy that I can just talk vision with and he'll run with it. Well, at the very end, when he, shared exp for a second it was just a subtle like seed but, like that's i think the most important thing to note is like when i joined the company there was i mean he he at that meeting actually brought up stocks and rev share and i said bro i don't even know what a stock is dude like i know what they kind of are but if that's what you thought was going to be attractive to me i'm selling 100 plus homes and i need help like i'm still showing buyers and so for six months, probably about six months, he solved that problem for me. And he solved that problem for me, changed my life. And then he was like, hey, here's the ISA model. And I was like, oh, shoot. Like if people are showing my homes and I want to take 20 vacations, like now my assembly line, no one's calling the leads. They're showing the homes now, but no one's calling the leads and I'm gone. So we got to keep this assembly line going. He sent me over, solve that. That's what I like. That I really want to like note that in this whole conversation that this all leads from production. Meaning, I didn't ever join EXP because I was going to go recruit agents. It was 
cool. This person's going to solve my problem. Dave and I joke all the time and we'll be like, Hey, he's like 44. I'm 39. He has five kids. I have no kids. He lives in Chandler. I live in North Peoria. It's about an hour and 10 minutes away. Like he was with Remax. I was with HomeSmart. Like, and what world does this ever make sense that we would have collided? And this dude would have been like, Hey, yeah, let me like mentor you. I've got five kids. Like, let me mentor you for the next uh, six months and take away from my kids time. And that, that sounds fair, huh? Like, I'm going to go back to my wife and be like, I make no money off this, get, um, but I'm going to give this this guy the time. And so that's what was so cool after he did that for six or seven months and I started building a better life. I was like, this is it. Like, I'm joining. If this is someone's going to solve my pain points, how could I lean into this? And then how could I go do this to other people? Because once that changes your life, like you feel like you got to go scream it. What, what you just described is what... Um a friend of mine said uh, who I stole this from wh which was basically not everybody participates. So we get the, we're the recruiting company, mm -hmm. right? That's what people say about EXP. Uh, but what you described was the fact that not everybody participates in revenue share. You didn't even care about it. You didn't know what it was, but everybody benefits because of revenue yep. share. So Dave, here's what Dave knew. Dave's a giver, by the way, he would have yeah. helped you anyways. And he also know he's also just more like when you align a set incentives with human behavior, you get the things that you we want more of. And so what EXP did is just align our incentives as human beings, as real estate agents to go, dude, here's the way I look at it is if you join EXP and like you have, right. If your business grows, then guess what? Dave's business grows. And if Dave's business grows, my business grows. So you can bet your ass, I'm going to do whatever I need to do to help Dave. And I'm going to do whatever I need to do to help you. And I'm going to do whatever I need to do to help Marshall or Daniel or Nolan or Mike. It doesn't matter. All of those guys, like, because here's the deal. I wanted to give back any, anyway. I was already giving back to the industry. So I want to do that anyways. And now I get a way that if I do it, I literally get rewarded for it, but I don't going to swipe your credit card to do it. That was my, that's why we never really launched the coaching program is like, I really, Chris, I couldn't get over wanting to not wanting to swipe my friend's credit cards. Yeah. And I use the word friends. Cause I really, like I've realized like my friends are all realtors for the most. I mean, I still have my friends outside of real estate, but the reality is the people that I spend the most time and the people that I would say probably are like my closest friends. They also happen to be in real estate at this point. And so I don't, it's not that I don't think what I have is valuable and worth swiping a credit card, but the minute you swipe somebody's credit card, the dynamics is different and there's, it's not wrong. It's just different. Yeah. And what's also very, very interesting that I've noticed over the last, you know, 17 months of being with EXP is uh, when I talk to certain people, it's like the level that they have to pay to get coaching, right? Like some people are paying up to, you know, two, three, four thousand dollars a month to get higher level coaching. And, and what's interesting is there's coaching and don't get me wrong. There's nothing wrong with coaching. Right. And then there's like, uh, like business consultants. And so I look at myself more as like a business consultant. Like when yes. you're, Hey, like you call me you're like, Hey, I'm happy. Like Dave was for me. Oh, that's your challenge. Like showing partner. And here's the contract that was $8,000 for me to do. Like, here's our, like, you can review that, have that. So it's like, instead of having someone for $1,500 a month that I pay for coaching, you just have somebody that's actually nitty gritty in the streets, not talking theory, not the, not the professor at college that's talking about building a business that's never built a business. And they're just like, go do it. Like someone who's straight up, you can say, this is my problem. And they can say, oh, that was my problem two years ago. I felt that pain. This is how I solved it. And I'm like, how'd you solve it? And I'm like, oh, because this guy helped me solve it. And you realize we're just, we're buying back our time so quickly because I used to at my old brokerage, I would have to like seek out a ton of people, try to get into a mastermind across state. And I would just be searching for that. I would have a challenge and it would take me about three to four months to solve every challenge I had in my business. And now the second I have a challenge, did it this morning to Dave. I said, Dave, I really think we need a VA. I just need you to give me a direction. And 7.30 in the morning, boom, boom, boom. Couldn't even read all the text because we had to jump on this podcast. I just hit him up nicely and said, hey, man, got these. Thank you. I'm going to read them tonight. I appreciate you. And so it was just, it was instead of three months of diving around and looking for this, it was just, there it is. 
now it's on you, bro. Like you now got to put in the work. That's all you need to get this done. I like that approach because it's not a, like you said, it's not swiping the credit card of $1,500 a month. And then I'm going to give you a 30 minute session. I call it checkpoints. I tell all the people that I'm working with, I don't have a structure on coaching checkpoints. Like call me with a problem. Let me tell you what to do. It takes some people 12 minutes to solve that problem. It takes some people 19 years to solve that problem. But when you solve that, hit me back up. I'll tell you my next advice. And we'll call them check. It's checkpoint coaching. This isn't structured Wednesday, That's, 1 p.m. Like you might not even have a problem I do that. in a week. Like check I point. do that to people all the time too. Okay. I'm like, go do it. In fact, you're going to get a phone call because I did that yesterday. Sorry. Okay. My buddy in Kentucky is going to call you because okay, I was like, cool. dude, you should call Chris. Okay. Uh, and I was like, then go have the conversation with Chris. And when he shares with you what he did, how he did what he, what you're trying to solve. I'll tell you what to do next. Okay. But you got to go figure that out first. So I do that. I do that same thing. Right. What, you, what you're describing, dude, is I've heard it referred to as like the cool thing about EXP is like you're picking a board of directors for your business or a friend of mine That's who cool. I, who I did coach formally for a couple of years. And, um, you know, and then when he moved to EXP, he was like, oh, you didn't recruit me. I recruited. I recruited you and Fred and Curtis to, to be my advisors in my business for free. <laughs> and I was like, damn, I hadn't thought of it that way, but he's right. Like he, he actually has the, he had the good lenses on of like, Oh, that's funny that you think you recruited me. I recruited you. He's I like, mean, I, he's like, fair, I recruited fair. you to be my business coach. Now fair. you're my, you're not, you're now my board of directors and my go-to guys and you're incentivized for it to happen. And I don't even have to pay you. And I'm like, yeah. Yeah, this guy gets it. Yeah, and that's what's cool about this, man. So, I mean, I still, obviously, this morning, I'm hitting up Dave because I'm asking questions about getting a VA in my company, you know, the pr production, solving that. You know, I get on the, I'm, I'm texting you and Fred, I mean, probably almost daily to try to figure out more of how to recruit at a better level. Um, so, man, what else? I mean, I hit up Curtis every once in a while if I want to just get like some just like, you know, like he, he, he's, he's, He's someone I can just ask a few questions to and he just gives me that spark I need in three sentences. I don't need 30 minutes of his time. I need like two minutes and I'm good. Yes, exactly. Like I, I, don't, like, I, don't, like, I don't need 45 minutes of someone's time. Like I need two seconds from you and boom, I just need a spark. Let's roll. So that's, yeah, I like the, I like how you said it, that they're more, they more recruited you. Like you really look at it. I mean, you put in work. I mean, there's, I put well, in a lot do, of work. He, I probably, I probably sold. 30 less homes this year by what I'm doing. So I, I literally looked like I had to make, there was a fork in the road and I just decided like, Hey, I'm cool with this. Like if yes. every, if I had to make every decision based off like dollars, I just, I can't, I did it. I did it in my, I did it in my previous seasons. I was like, Hey, I'll go do that for money. And now I'm just like, Hey, I just want to do this because I, that makes me smile. It makes yeah, me dude. smile. And then for some reason, the more I'm smiling, the more I'm making passive. And I'm like, let's just roll with this, right? Flow state. You can't you can't have two North Stars. So either money is your North Star or time is your North Star. And I'm not saying this is the only two, but either time or money are, is your it. North Star with most real estate agents or most business owners. And um, you got to a decision where you said time is my North Star. And so I'm going to, that means I have to spend my working time on things that make as some of, as my buddy uh, would call it crock pot money instead of microwave money. Okay. Microwave money is the next transaction. No, nothing wrong with that. Like in, in fact, I believe we should have a lot of that and you should do that in, until you have enough to feel safe. And then it's time to go to crock pot mode. And, and you went, time is more important to me now. And so I'm going to crock pot mode and now my activities will lead to crock pot money instead of microwave money. That's what you did, man. And um, the biggest problem with our industry is that people don't ever make that switch. And so they get, they get trapped into the micro, they get trapped into next month's deals forever, no matter how much money they make. Dude, I know guys making million, $2 million a year that like, and, and they're spending every penny of it. And I mean, I've seen it happen time and time again. And it's just, it's a, it's, it's a trap. And EXP just was the first company that came along and said, Hey, let me give you a crock pot mode that you can just plug into doing what you already do. And are you already good at? Yeah, man, that's good stuff. I know with that park city mastermind, I had got up to speak, you know, friend had asked me to do so. 
And I remember going through this and I just want to say it out loud and kind of get your opinion on it. But, you know, I've, I've had some people who are like, hey, well, you know, to recruit agents would take it takes time. And I'm like, oh, okay, let's, I was like, let's talk this through. That's, that's actually a very valid. And it does. It actually takes a lot of time. Like, let's go, let's go down this lane. And I said, so here's the deal. We've got, we've got retirement coming. Maybe, I don't know. Let's talk about that. Like we've got this age of like, or, or I'll ask him like, what day do you want to be like financially secure where you could say, I'm not running around selling homes anymore. And some are like, Hey, I want to do this forever. Like when I'm 92, I'm still going to be doing this. I'm like, that's good. Cool. Um, So then I say like, well, when do you want to be done with selling real estate? And, and they'll give me give me an age, and I'll say, okay, now, what are you going to invest in to go? Like, how much passive income do you have to have a month to live a cool life? And they're like, well, this is how much I would need. All right, so and I'm like, think of this time like this. I would tell them with my rental properties, and I have twenty of them. I said during that three four year span where I bought those, it was make. I didn't buy these creative financing. These were twenty twenty five percent downs. It was. Make a lot of money selling homes, not going and buying really, really cool stuff that you felt you could have, that you felt you deserve, but the world owes me nothing. Then figure out how to have help people help me do it like a business. Now spit out a profit after taxes. Now it's got to spit me off a profit. Now it's got to go over. It's got to go over into my personal life, right? It goes over into my personal life. Then it's got to go through a funnel of, vacations, clothes, mortgage, this, th and then it's got a, at the bottom of that funnel, there's a little bit of money. And that little bit of money now has to go find properties. I couldn't find, can't find them in Arizona anymore. They were too expensive, right? So now I got to go spend all my time investing, researching, flying other states to find out where I'm going to buy. Then you got to go buy those. So it's, it's got to be, you got to go literally lead generate, get a lead through, figure out how to convert them. Get them through your business, which you have employees, get to the bottom of that with a profit, put it over into your funnel of your personal life, get it through vacations, kids, college, cars, and you have a little bit in that funnel. And then now you got to go spend 20 hours a week trying to find something you can invest in. And then there you go. And then you wake up at whatever age and now you have what you have and you can do what you got to do. And so it's like, did that take time? And they're like, yeah. And I'm like, well, at least keep it in the space that you're in every day where when you're talking to your homies on the phone. Or other realtors, like it's so much easier than flying to another state and trying to buy this, you know, asset where you got to have a debt to income ratio and they're looking at your PL and and they're like, I don't know if you can qualify for this house. And you're like, I make enough for this house, right? Like, but like so I'm just saying like, why wouldn't we then just say, yeah, this might take three hours a week, you know, like why wouldn't I do three hours a week for the next five years to have a really cool future? So like that time equation to me is fascinating and so i just bring that up as we're probably coming to a wrap and want to hear like your opinion on that whole analogy because that time thing has really got me bonkers anymore like everything well, takes time i think that most people chris i know you and you're a special individual most people don't stop to think that far ahead you you're you're unique in the sense that you go i have a goal but then like what do i actually got to do to get there and you start to chunk things down naturally. I don't think most people do that. I think a lot of it, I, I didn't do that. I realized even myself, I was like, dude, I got into real estate because I read Rich Dad, Poor Dad. Yeah. And then I had a mentor who was literally living that life. And he convinced me that if I ever wanted to be an investor, I, I had to like keep working to make enough money to buy investments that would then make me money. And I was, so that's why I got into real estate, dude. Because Professor Goodner was like, you still need to keep a job. So I was like, I'm just going to go work in real estate. And so then, but I was all in on investing and cash flow. And then I got so, f I fell in love with like the, the business of real estate sales. And I was like, oh, this is a business. And then I forgot that, I forgot why I got in. And it wasn't until like five years ago, somebody posted in our Facebook group, Next Level Agents. Oh, my mentor always told me, you don't get rich selling real estate, you get rich buying in real estate. And I was like, oh. Dude, I forgot it. Right. So even though I like I was focused and it was good, I was building something good. We talked about that earlier. I'm not ashamed of it. But I didn't stop to think through the questions that you just said. And I think that I think I'm probably more like most people than you are in the sense that I don't naturally start to break things down. I have a pie in the sky goal or aspiration that might be cool to do someday. And I might even, and I'm super um uh, optimistic. So I'm like, 
I'm going to get there. I'm going to get there. I'm going to get there. And so oftentimes that'll give me the energy. I think it was James clear was like the thing about optimism is it gives you the delusion that you can get there soon enough. So <laughs> like your advantages is that you actually start. Yeah. Right. And it, even though it ends up taking you a lot longer than, than you thought it would, your, your optimistic viewpoint is an advantage because it gets you to, it fools you, it tricks you into starting. Yeah. And so I, so I do that, but you're like, you're intelligent and you're like, oh, I'm going to break this down. And then, and you think about all those dumb steps that I don't want to think about. And quite frankly, I think more people are probably like me in the sense they also don't stop to think about that stuff. Um, and so, but that's why we need people in our lives. Like this is why I need you in my life and why I need Fred in my life and why I need Curtis in my life and Andrew Franklin and what, and yes, every name I just named is at EXP and yes, every one of those people I care about and cares about me. And we literally try to help each other get what we said we wanted. Yeah. That's the, that like, that's the thing. Like you have to be around if you don't naturally think like you do, or even if you do like you, you need some mirrors, you need some people going, Hey, hold on a second. What about this thing over here? What about this step? You're missing this step. So let me slow you down. So that way you don't waste the next 10 years. There it is, man. Do you have like five more minutes? Or yeah. you a hard stop. Okay. No, uh, I just let's let's end with you know because what's funny about this man is about two weeks ago I said, hey man, would you jump on the podcast and let's talk about the ten x hook? Oh yeah, and, that's and right. I, I, I forgot because, that was the point of today's. Uh, I but totally forgot. No, but that's funny that I don't care. Meaning, like that was the intentions really to get you on and talk about that book, but. I'd rather just freestyle a conversation with you. The same conversation we would have had at a coffee shop for an hour. That's like legitimately what you and I would have talked about, even if it was just entertaining ourselves. <laughs> Cause sometimes uh, you need I, to be, I have to be, um, what was, who was I listening to yesterday? And they, no, it was Runyon where he was saying like, you've got to have a story that's so compelling that you sometimes have to like say it to yourself again. And like, that's why I'm like, this conversation is sometimes like, I know it, we know it, but like just you and I having this conversation, there's truth to it. But like, it just, it took me from a level seven of energy to a level 10, even though it was just you and I talking, like, I think sometimes you can just hype yourself up with a few friends, even if you're talking about the same mission, same goal, it could be the same mission, same goal you had a year ago. But I think those are, those are your friends where like, I don't know who you say it to me often We you text me, it's like, uh, like, lo like long-term goals or, you know, what, whatever, I think it might be James clear. Or someone that talks about like doing things today that are for like the future. Yeah. And I yeah, think exactly. it's, it's, it's when you have a, to me, it's when you have a five-year goal. So like you have to keep talking to that person and it's the same goal. It's, it's the same conversation. It's the same goal. And it was really cool to now like seeing how I got recruited into EXP and like, that's now my passion is like, I have several realtors now that I've helped that like right now this month have a hundred G's coming through that we're not having a hundred G's come through. And I'm just like, dude, if that's not winning on their end, like what is like, that just feels super good, man, to like bring someone in that was not doing that. Give them playbooks, mentorship. They're doing that. Like you can see where these conversations spark us because it's not just about us. I want to make sure that I note that here as we're ending like this isn't about us. It's about them as well. And it, here, I guess it could be about both us, right? Like, why can't we do something in life where it's like, Hey, this is good for you. It's good for me. Cool. We well, good? Dude, do you, it's like, I told you that one day, uh, you know, you said something about we, we were recruiting and yes. like recruiting <laughs> another agent from, from this particular office, like another one. And it was like, I was like, i made the joke of like that, that might be operated by somebody else, but it's owned by Chris Bowers. And you were like, Hey, it's nothing personal. And I was like, no, dude, it's fucking personal because yep. look at this guy who just yep. posted about his first hundred K month. Tell me that's not personal to him. Like that's per that's as personal as it gets. Right? Dude, you, you, yeah, you said that, man. And I was like, game on now every day. I'm like, this is personal. I used to always do that. That's a cliche. You know, you're like, oh, this isn't, this isn't personal. This is business. And I'm like, no, this is personal, man. Like if I can give this guy a way to live a better life or a better quality life or get more time back or retire earlier. I'm like, I almost feel now obligated to have conversations with people as like, it's the good news. Like I've got to go tell you that I could help you. Cool. Reject yeah. me. I don't care. Like I'm good. But like, I want those, I want, I want more and more of those stories in my life. So that when I'm 70 and 80, 
there can be like two or 300 agents that are just like, Hey, that dude, like he helped. And that's all I like. That's really at now as I'm getting older, I'm like, I just want someone to be like, Hey, he helped me. And so if that's what I get, that's what I get. But let's go back to 10 X. So at park city, you had the author of that book and you interviewed him there. Super cool that you can get an author. I wish I could pull that off. Um, what did that book mean to you? Cause it was what you meld that to me. Thank you. And probably spark some of the coolest thought process ever. And it helped me really that gain and gap and things like that. Like it, it, it allowed somebody who's usually not very forgiving of themselves, you know, always wanting to be ahead to like yeah. sit back for a minute and just be like, Hey, like, you know I mean? Like you did. Okay. Uh, what did that book do for you? Like, why I, was that one that you read and sent out to people? It totally messed with my head. Okay. Totally. To, to be honest with you, I was having, I was struggling with the 10 X concept. Um, and, you know, but in a good way. So there's been books that I would say have impacted my life more. So I want to be really clear, but this book caused me to think more than, than most books have in the last handful of years. And, um, it was around mindset and just the, it, like, just listen to the title, like 10 X is easier than two X. It's kind of like, what? It'd be easy to write that off as bullshit. But <laughs> when you really go into it, Ben is so good at what he does that he's got this great way of like building his argument and he's with him having a psychology background and understanding business at a high level, like he really puts it together. Right. And so for me, that book was about, um, he said something like he, he believed that having a belief in your future is critical, very obvious, but like, how many of us don't like, again, cause we just think like, I just got to do these things, right. I'm doing these things. Well, great. But for what? And so, and he talked, the three thing that really messed me up was when he talked about his past, present and future identity model. Yep. And how we talked about, it was like a lot of, like, we all have it backwards. Like we let our past determine our future, our, our, our present. The reality is our present determines our past. And if we are, if we do this right, we should let our future determine our present. And it's like, wait, what? But when you hear him break that down and anybody who wants this, you can reach out to Chris or me and I will share this private video with you yeah. where he describes that because that alone for me cleared up everything. That one, that one little model that he shared cleared up everything for me. So that was big. I'm not going to, I'm not going to butcher it and try to give it away and talk about, you know, all the details that he did, yeah. but you know, the other thing too, and is he talked about like, the purpose of having, I think he used the term impossible goals and like the, like the actual value of that, that was really big for me. Um, I think that he also, he referred to like, even his, um, his life as like a draft, like he's a writer. So everything's yeah. a draft copy. And it's like, even what happened yesterday is a draft. And like you and I right now, we could talk about yesterday and it's a draft. It, that's a draft of my life yesterday. And by this time tomorrow, my draft of yesterday could actually be different. I could have a different viewpoint because I'm going to be a different person and I could choose to view that differently. So there was, there was really a lot in that book that re that gave me a lot to chew on mentally. Yeah, it was, it was refreshing, man. Like I actually, you, you sent the vi video of you actually interviewing him at that mastermind that we were at. And on the way home on the plane, I was watching it like again and i was like that was i think the best part because i'm i feel total opinion i feel that people talking to myself aren't getting to where they want in life just on mindset like i think it's so it's, it's not enough no i mean i think that you know when someone's like hey i want to sell 60 homes i'm always like more of like when they're like how do i do this i'm like wait i'm like why do you want to do this how much are you willing to sacrifice a day to get it like, what are you doing it for? Like when you get knocked in the teeth, why are you still doing it? When you get knocked in the teeth two more times, why are you like, I want to dig deep on not just like, I want to make money. Like, why are we doing this? Um, and I feel like that book, you know, was like a connection to that. Like a, Hey, this is what you want in the future. And this is what you have to do today to get there. I mean, it makes so much sense, but I think what's cool about he's somebody who a lot of people could have wrote that book. But like, there's only so many people that can relay it in a way that's just digestible. So it's like nothing, I yeah. don't think it's nothing groundbreaking. Like you're not going to read it and be like, oh my gosh, I've never heard, I've never seen these words put together. 
It's just when someone can put certain words together and then in the interview that you had with them, when he explains it with his charts and you're just really looking at it like that 80, 20, I mean, I started looking at that. I'm like, Oh man, like what would tomorrow really look like if I changed 80% of what I did to go get what I want? Like, but that's what some of us have to do. Like if you've got an impossible goal, we think about it. We're like, we like, it's like, I might have to change the time I wake up. I might have to change what I do in the morning. I might have to change my morning routine. I might have to do, I might have to walk into the office with my three employees and do totally different things than what I did yesterday. I might have to take off earlier. I might have to work later. I, you, I mean, you really, when you think about like changing 80% of your day, I mean, to most people, that's just like groundbreaking of like, how could I do that? I'm like, well, that's what it might take to get what you just said. So you have to reconcile that. Like, and, and Runyon said this too on your Zoom that you had, people would rather, they would rather change their goal than change their daily actions. Yeah. So like, yeah. they would just rather like be like soon, soon enough, they're not there. And there's like, oh, that wasn't really even my goal. And it was like, no, like it's actually better to say like, that still is your goal, but you weren't willing to change your daily actions to get it. And that would actually be a more honest reflection. For example, me, like I don't have the abs I want. Cause I, like, I don't tell people I don't have, it's not like, oh my gosh, it's like, I eat too many chips and salsa. Like that's like a, like that, that right there leads to this. There's nothing groundbreaking about that, but um, yeah. Dude, the way he broke down, like, Hey, if you want to X something, the truth is you only have to change about 20% of what you do. Yeah. Uh, but if you want to 10 X and his argument is it's easier then you have to change 80% of your daily actions. So <laughs> that, that's tough. like, that's like, yeah, that's tough. Cause if that means, by the way, that's another way of saying what got you here, won't get you there straight up or the way he described at the beginning, Michelangelo, uh, somebody interviewed Michelangelo about the David. They're like, how did you do that? How did you see it? He's like, well, it's simple. I just chipped away everything that wasn't David. Yeah. Right. And not for me, like that was like, oh, I've heard Joe Polish, who I, I know Ben because of Joe. Joe said something like, be willing to destroy everything in your life that isn't excellent. Which is another way of saying good is the enemy of great. Yeah. Like, yes, you could be doing something good. And those that good could be the fucking chain holding you on to what you have and holding you away from what it is we say that we want. And the tough part why we don't want to change psychologically is we have these identities. We have this identity, the self-identity about who we think that we are. And that's actually the trick is to yep. like give up our identity, but we're all, we're so busy the, as human beings. I know, up. man. I know. So we just here. here's what I heard is, you know, you got to sit down every once in a while. I, I think it's just, and we'll end with this, but. I would just encourage everyone to just like find an hour to put in your calendar that just says, just sit and just think about your future with really no like computer around, you know, just maybe a legal pad, a pen and a calculator. I think that's like my mom always used to say, like almost everything can be solved, Chris, you know, money issues, weight issues life ish, like almost everything can be solved with just like a legal pad, a pen and a calculator. And so it's like, we sit down and we start thinking and we start scrolling through things on the phone. And like, we're really not thinking. It's just like, I think we need, I, I think that could be the first start. And I'm talking to myself. I want to do more of this in my life, but if we just don't think, what do we want to change, but just say, Hey, I'm going to block off an hour in my calendar that just says, think about my life and my future. I'm doing that right when we get off, dude. Text me and make sure I did it. Just like an hour where there's no nothing around except for a legal pad, a calculator, and a pen. It's just the time on the calendar says, think about my future. And I think that really that hour will be eye-opening to people and myself where it's like, you're going to start getting some thoughts that I think are going to be a little nerve-wracking. And I also think that it might be something you don't make reoccurring because we don't know how to handle that hour without the media and without social media and without numbing it with whatever we numb ourselves with like that hour is going to bring up a lot of stuff where you're either going to say, Ooh, am I too late? Am I too early? And it's going to make you really sit there and think like, Oh shoot. Like, but what's cool about it to me is it didn't change whether it scared you or not. Right. So it just gets scary. It's, it's really just going to get worse. I think as it goes. So if something's, if something that I sit at and I think, man, like, I wish I would have did this earlier in my life. I then say, 
well, man, I probably should do it today then, right? Because I'm like, I don't think in a 10 more years, I'll be like, oh, like it's just, it's got to start. So I think that's something that I want to do. And thanks for, you know, let me talk out loud where I, re- you know, realize that, that I need to do more of that in my life. Yeah, I think we all do. Cool, man. Well, dude, I appreciate you. I appreciate I you, your, dude. Appreciate your friendship, man. I appreciate all that you're, all that you're doing because I see it, you know, it's like, I and I'll end it with this, that there was, times in my life where I focused on the people leading the way in production. And that was super fun to watch. It was a really cool time in my life. I love it. I just, it was so fun. It was a good mission. I followed those people. And now like I see you and I'm like, that's cool. Right. That's someone who's been in the game. A lot of seasons changed his mindset going kind of a different direction with things. And just, you're an inspiration to a lot of people uh, you've got a good community of people that you have merged together and all help each other out now. And I'm, I'm super thankful for it. Well, thanks, dude. I'm thankful you're um, part of it and also doing the same because I benefit from knowing you, man. I, cool, man. I really do. Well, later, bro. Thanks for your time. Hi, right, brother. Talk to you soon. Later, man.